think there will be a few more folks logging on, but I'm going to go ahead and um, get us started. So this is the NAMI Grand Rapids Area Education Session, and our um, guest today, guests today are uh, Mindy Greiling and Jim Greiling, and, and Roger uh, is also on here as part of the family. So it's good to see you too, Roger. Thanks for joining us. Um, they'll be talking about um, their family story and also a book that uh, Mindy and Jim wrote together about their family. Uh, I'm going to be admitting a few people as we go along here. I'm Mary Marcus and I'm the president of uh, NAMI Grand Rapids area. We have uh, uh, our, our mission. We work really hard on um, providing education, uh, providing support and advocacy for um, kids and adults and their families that have mental illness. I could go on and on about that, but I will not because the purpose of this is um, give you information about um, the Grylings experience. One of the things I do want to mention two things is that we think that perhaps the next um, education session will be on the um, 988 number. It's a national number that's being rolled out this summer um, for uh, suicide prevention intervention. And in our local community, in the Itasca area and Northern Minnesota, uh, First Call for Help 211 will be the, um, the answerer for that number. So I'd like to have Cree Larson come in. I'm hoping that she'll be able to do that. So keep your eyes open for that future event. And then we're also um, in the process of exploring the possibility of a future theme uh, for several sessions coming up, um, being perhaps kicked off by a, a speaker who um, is you know, high key. Um, on stress, uh, uh, trauma, and post-trauma uh, stress, coming off of the, slowly coming off of the COVID pandemic and recognizing that a lot of people have experienced increased mental health issues at the time, not the least of which are our frontline workers. So we'll be um, exploring that idea a little bit further and we'll keep you posted about um, future education sessions in that regard. So with that introduction, um, Patty, I'm going to hand it off to you to introduce uh, Jim and Mindy. Thanks, Marion. Um, I, I want to recommend if you haven't had a chance to um, read this, I, I got through it in two days. So it's, I was fascinated by it. Um, Fix What You Can, it's the book that um, Mindy and Jim wrote about their journey of um, dealing with mental illness. Um, Mindy uh, was a legislator at the time that their family um, became involved with Jim's mental illness. And she was a state legislator for 20 years. And she had a very unique perspective because she could see which laws were problematic, which laws didn't exist that would have been helpful. Um, she also started the first um, mental health caucus in the country, um, in our legislature, and accomplished a lot of things while she was a, while she was a representative. Uh, so, you know, thanks to her, um, things um, have improved and continue to improve. Um, and she was very uh, instrumental in um, increasing the funding in the state of Minnesota for mental health. Um, Jim um, works now part-time for NAMI, um, National Alliance of Mental Illness in Minnesota, in their office. Um, and we're very, very pleased to have both of them here today. And I know Mindy had said when we talked to her initially that there would be plenty of time for questions um, at the end. So um, if you think of something, um, either write it down or put it in the chat and uh, that would be very useful. And I would remind you before we start to, if you're not speaking, if you could mute yourself, uh, makes it a little bit easier to hear the speakers. So 
Um, if you would do that, we'd appreciate it. And I will turn it over to Mindy and Jim. All right. Okay. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Marianne, and everybody at Park Ra or Grand Rapids, I should say, area NAMI. And I have to share one little cameo coincidence. I just finished up a term, a two year term of being president of NAMI Ramsey County. And at the very end of my term, one of our board advisors, we have board members and advisors that are co um, help us with other organizations. So one of our board advisors, um, Tara Ellis is on here and she was a member of NAMI Ramsey County and she just moved to Grand Rapids. So I told her I would see her on this program and I'm thrilled, Tara, that you are here. So we actually had a Tara and a Tara on our board. So we don't have to worry about the pronunciations anymore, but we wish she were still with us. So I'll just tell you people in Grand Rapids, she was a wonderful um, asset to our board and as a family member. So good to see you, Tara. Um, so um, in the two and a half years since my book came out, our book, Fix What You Can, Jim, for those of you who have read it, I just want to say right off the beginning um, that he's doing so much better than at the end. I kept thinking during the um, five years that I was writing it, that it would be very nice if we had a happy ending or a happier ending than we seem to be at at every juncture. And if I had waited two and a half more years, um, we would have had a better ending. But families who are dealing with mental illnesses, which is probably an awful lot of us here on this, this program, um, know that happy endings are, you know, temp can be fleeting and temporary or hard to come by. So people have told me the way it did end was realistic and you know seemed to be um, something people could relate to. But Jim is doing so much better. And when the book first came out in the fall of 2020, already it seems so long ago, um, I don't think he could have participated as he's doing today. So we're grateful. So I will start out um, talking a little bit about my grandmother because she's in the book. And she's a good contrast to Jim and the mental health system today. So I grew up with her uh, right across the street from me uh, up until I was 10 years old in 1958. And at that time, she was taken by the sheriff to the Rochester State Hospital. She had schizophrenia and she had lived across the street from us and was there doing actually pretty well. As a lot of people know, women, um, females tend to get the schizophrenia type illnesses later in life and often do better because of it. But um, she, her life was disrupted when my uncle got married and she didn't have structure in her life. So she had to go to the state hospital. And back in 1958, that was right when Minnesota had just outlawed straitjackets, Governor Luther Luther Youngdahl had led that crusade and they had just barely been outlawed. And also nationally, I'm sure a lot of you know, lobotomies had just barely stopped being a panacea for people like my grandmother. So she escaped those things, but she was at the state hospital for the rest of her life until she went to the nursing home. So um, I was very glad when Jim entered the mental health system that things had changed. But, but as you, those of you who read the book know, I asked myself when I was writing it, how much has it changed really? So I wanna bring Jim in here now because I'm guessing he's glad to have escaped the state hospital, but what would you say about the mental health system, Jim? Well, um, it's definitely not perfect. Um, it has a really bad uh, psychiatry, um, as a, a sordid past, I would say. And um, I have uh, been in restraints and isolation. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm kind of nervous. That's all right. I'll start over. How about I start over? Sure. Uh, 
Well, okay. How would I feel about that? I would feel probably, I'm sure, pretty bad. And I w- I'm glad that I was around with my mental illness after a few decades after that. Um, and uh, it had, like I was saying, it had a really, really bad history. Um, uh, I was in restraints and isolation. I'm glad I wasn't, you know, I was in Nelka. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm dying here. <laughs> You're doing fine. <laughs> Not really. Uh, I, well, I was in the, okay. Yeah, I was. The worst that I experienced with that was um, I was at Anoka Metro Treatment Center for almost a year, nine months. So I have some experience with that. And I've, yeah, I'm glad, glad it wasn't really. Right. So um, I think when we get around to the question and answer at the end, Jim will be more comfortable because he kind of tried to think of it, rehearse this a little bit, and then that sometimes isn't helpful. Um, so, um, when um, Jim was first getting sick, we actually did not tumble to the fact that he was getting a mental illness until he was past 20. When he, even up to when he was 20, he, we knew he had changed his friends in high school and we knew he was into drugs and we knew he wasn't working up to capacity, but we were still not even, even with my grandmother, you know, I felt like I, knew what schizophrenia was, but it didn't present that way with Jim and when he was getting sick. And so we were uh, totally clueless until he was 21. And then he had a big episode, which in the summer, which ended him up in the psych ward. And that's when we finally got a diagnosis. And we were shocked because we didn't know what was going on. But in the meanwhile, um, Jim knew what was inside of his head a lot more than what we did. So maybe you could talk about that. Well, when I first got sick, um, uh, well, yeah, well, first of all, I, when I was probably about 20, I was very, became very depressed and I, it had been you know, escalating ever since, really since um, junior high, looking back on things. Um, and uh, that's, all, that's what I thought it was. I thought I was depressed and even just that the stigma was worse that, you know, 20 years ago. So I, I wanted to hide it. And I thought it was like totally like something not to be talked about, to be hidden. And I felt really bad about it. Besides just being depressed, I felt bad about being depressed. Um, and then eventually a year or two later, when I was 21, it turned into pretty much full-blown psychosis. And I didn't know I mean, the, you know, by definition, you can't know you're delusional and be delusional. So I, I thought I was doing good. I thought I was doing good, um, having a great summer and being cool. And looking back on things, I was just in my own world, you know, thinking really, really strange thoughts, like having my own language. Um, it's complicated as that may be. Um, so, yeah, I was... I was very sick, and then when I was 21, on the 4th of July, for the first time, I went to the psych ward. And it was kind of strange because I don't know if it's just coincidence, but the first night, uh, the first time I was in the psych ward, I got sicker, like I'm markedly sicker than I was. It's just it's coincidence, I guess. Um, but yeah, and then it got worse from there. <laughs> and then, well, I'll find out. Um, that, that's, I think that's good for now. So then when um, I had the advantage when Jim was sick of being in the legislature at the time, like uh, Patty said in the introduction, so advocacy is usually the last form of grief. You know, you have um, denial and anger and all the bargaining and all the stages. Um, Advocacy comes last as we cycle back and forth. But for me, it was like, I had denial and I had anger, but I also had advocacy all along. So the first piece of legislation I ever worked on was coming from Jim's first time in the psych ward. He, when I called the next morning to see how he was doing, I'm sure a lot of people have had that experience. They told me they could not talk to me because, or they didn't even say because, they just said, we can't talk to you, Um, he's an adult. And so I later found out about releases of information and went to the legislative 
staff that helps us draw up, helps legislators draw up bills. And I asked uh, for legislation to make mental illness the same as physical illnesses. So you could talk to people in the hospital, the medical professionals. And I was told actually the law is the same for physical and mental illnesses. It's just that it's applied in the psych ward and it isn't applied very uniformly other places, or if it is, it's kind of a routine thing. But in the psych ward, they make a bigger deal out of it. So, um, so I did have legislation to say hospitals in the psychiatric wards had to explain releases to families who didn't know and how it was applied. And then they also had to encourage people like Jim each day as they got better and better to sign the release. And then there could be family communication. And actually it turned out no one had ever even asked him. They, and as soon as he was asked, he signed it. So um, uh, it was just a, a satisfying piece of legislation, even though it didn't do much. And I really wondered if it was really needed if the hospitals were using common sense. And, but the other piece that I worked on right away was because when the police came to our door, when we called 911, because Jim, as he said, was having a complete meltdown and was had punched holes in our walls and was slamming doors and other things. Um, the police said there was nothing they could do because um, we chose to have him living here and he wasn't imminently dangerous to himself or others. And so that legislation I worked on, and I actually heard from people all over the state that they were having the same problems, and we were able to be one of the first states to work with the Treatment Advocacy Center, if you're familiar with that group, to remove the word imminent from um, getting help for people if they were uh, spiraling down and getting sick. So there could be earlier help, and we added in property damage so that now people who are doing property damage in a psychotic episode can get help without waiting to be dangerous, which many people never get to that level and they can't get help early enough to put out the fire in their brain. Um, one of the points of our book is that mental illness affects family. So Roger's on here, my husband and Jim's dad, and he, um, he was, he's been affected by it. If you've read the book, you know that we had some arguments about what was the best path and how we could help Jim the best. And each of us had our own ways and they weren't the same. And so marriages are affected with, um, with when you have mental illness or actually any big disease, but I think mental illness is the most confusing and upsetting because of people not being in their right minds. Um, so he's been affected, but he, like all, everyone in our family, including Jim, um, mentor others who are new to the illness and, and um, try to help them out. Um, our uh, son-in-law has done that. Our daughter happens now, she just started a new job a week and a half ago. So she now is the head of Bloomberg um, Bloomberg government. So she's covering Congress, or she's not covering it, all of her reporters are, and she's um, editing their work, helping with giving them assignments and so forth. So that's a very powerful spot where they could do a better job, I always think, covering mental health legislation. And she's, um, when she was a reporter, she's written articles about it. So she's doing things. And then our granddaughter, uh, I mentioned the Treatment Advocacy Center that I worked with you know, tw 20 years ago. She's doing an internship there this summer and all during her senior year when her project for her senior capstone was schizophrenia and quantum physics. She tied, tied those two together. Um, so, and she's been busy with, um, uh, with the edibles, which were legal in the marijuana edibles, legal in Washington, DC before here, uh, she as a teenager, has had friends who have used them. She doesn't because she's been listening to her grandmother, she said, about the connection with psychosis and marijuana. But um, she's had to deal with friends and she's tried, tried to help them. So we're all involved because of, um, because of Jim. So um, 
Jim, how I'm going to ask you then, how do you feel about all this family involvement and and did it change your thoughts of it at all after you read the, the chapters that I was writing and how the your illness affected us? Well, I'm, I was kind of used, I have been used to my mom being someone of a public figure and um, her uh, <clears throat> talking about me. Um, I want to talk. Um, <clears throat> My, um, I'm having a panic attack, by the way. That's why I'm acting like this. So. I could usually do it better. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I, I was a little bit, I was kind of brought up in the public, so I didn't think as much of it as uh, some people would. But my mom um, started working on legislation for mental health and all of that. Um, I just, in the end, I thought if it helps somebody else hearing my story, uh, then it's worth it. And you know, no people, you're not alone. Um, so, yeah. So, so when we were, um, so I, I wrote the book, like I said, it took me five years and I joined the Loft Literary Center and took classes and was in a writing group. And they were the first ones to see what I wrote. But Jim was the next person, and I really um, felt like he had to buy in. If I was going to write all these personal stories and tell about what he was going through, then I felt like I really needed his buy-in. I'm, by the way, a person, some people think if you don't get the person with mental illnesses buy-in, then you're dead in the water. And I guess our family is unusual because, because I have been talking about my family in public since Jim was actually in third grade because I was on the school board before the legislature. So I always used my family as examples you know, when I was trying to prove my points or their friends or somebody. So, so Angela and Jim, Angela's two years older than Jim. We're just used to that. And so, so I didn't, so I just kept talking about Jim. NAMI, Minnesota referred reporters to me about different issues. And I kept talking about our family. So by the time I was writing the book, I felt I'd already been talking about Jim. And, and like he said, he's used to it. But nonetheless, when I started writing this book, I really felt this was going past the sort of cursory comments I might make in public and I needed needed to get his buy-in. So he was the next the next um, reader of all the chapters. So can you kind of talk about how we did that? Uh, <clears throat> Alex did have a, I have fond, pretty fond memories of uh, sitting in the coffee shop, my mom reading a chapter or two of her, what she wrote and critiquing it. And when, when people say we wrote the book, it's pretty much she wrote the book. I just had two very small corrections and comments that probably made in the book. Um, yeah, we, uh, we had a good time figuring, figuring the book out. And, and Jim minimizes his role because like I just said, um, really, if he, I held my breath when he was reading some of the chapters and some of the sections, because I thought he might strike with his red pen, not just add in or correct the small things that he's talking about. I thought he might strike whole sections, but he actually didn't. And we did discuss how it would help other people. And that's part of Jim's generous spirit. So, um, We've just got a couple more things and then we look forward to questions. But we, I want to just reiterate the main messages that we wanted to get across in the book. And one of them, the first and foremost one is empathy for people like us, people with mental illnesses and their families. Um, and as I said, we wanted to show how uh, schizophrenia, especially, or bipolar, the serious mental illnesses affect the whole family, not just the person with the illness. And I, as you, if you've read the book, you know, I'm, uh, uh, one goal was to shed light on dysfunctional parts of the mental health system. 
every time we ran into trouble that, and I had frustrations over it, often those things made it into the book. And I had to, um, in the course of editing, a lot of things got edited out because you didn't want to be repetitious. So I think what's in there is pretty representative of problems that we had. Um, I also wanted to um, talk about in the book what happens when the mental health system doesn't work. And that means criminalizing often the person with mental illness. Um, Jim, my computer is telling me the internet connection is unstable. So I hope you can still hear me. But um, Jim ended up in jail um, three times that I can think of, maybe four, all times he could have been taken to the hospital if they had been recognizing that he was in a mental health crisis, not a hardened criminal, but he ended up there and he was in mental health court one time for which we were grateful, a diversionary program. But the last time, the second time he should have qualified for mental health court, he was sent to felony court. So I uh, strongly object to that. And that may, remains one of my causes. So what can you do to not criminalize people? And there's a nice program coming up, I'll just say on August 11th, that will be at the Humphrey Institute that I'm on a panel where they're bringing in Judge Steve Leifman, if you're familiar with the Miami Dade program where they try to have people not have criminal records when they have a mental illness if they get into um, problems. And so he's a, a nationally recognized speaker in that program. And then Attorney General Keith Ellison will be part of it and others. Um, so that's something I continue, continue to work on. Um, and then um, lastly, I always like to model advocacy because I feel like I have huge advantages. Having been a legislator, I'm white, middle class, and, um, and I think a lot of people don't know how to advocate as well as, as I do perhaps. And so I like to show what I've done. And one of the main things is personal advocacy is I contact elected officials. Myself, when I was in the legislature, I still contacted other elected officials. Now I contact my county commissioner, um, Tara, Tara. Tara knows that NAMI Ramsey County works with Ramsey County and the commissioners, and we're trying to make the mental health system better. We had a listening session and talked about problems, and now we're working with them to fix them. Um, so I wanted to advocate and also um, political advocacy. And I know some current legislators have, have read my book and are taking it to heart. So I hope it helps in that regard. So we're just the last thing we're going to each talk about a slight bit is what we would like to see as improvements in the health system. And so I would my I will go first and I would like to see supportive housing. Uh, there is it's very hard to get apartments and if you do get one um, often you're just in an apartment. There's no support there. And people Jim um, has an apartment, but it, there's absolutely zero support. So he's at our house. And before I die, I would like to have him in something that's where he could get support and not be so, de so dependent on the support from us. Um, and that kind of housing is almost non-existent. So that's a big thing. I would like to see um, clozapine be more in the forefront. It's the best antipsychotic. It's the reason Jim is doing so well. He is hopefully he'll get over the panic attack before the program is over, but um, he's doing so well. He has very few um, breakthrough psychosis episodes anymore since he started on, or he has stopped. They're not nearly as long or severe as he had before he was on clozapine. And um, so that is a drug that I think more psychiatrists should know about. I'm working with a psychiatrist at the University of Minnesota to try to get that drug more used. He agrees and said, though, it's harder to use than some others. So a lot of psychiatrists are reticent to use it. And um, then there should be, I think, more culturally specific providers um, 
if you're already confused and you don't know what's going on and people like Jim initially didn't trust the mental health system and then think of if you're a person of color, a BIPOC person, and you're trying to access the mental health system. So there needs to be more providers and more programs that make everybody feel comfortable. And then the last thing for me is I'm really on, on a tear right now to have non-crisis care. You know, it seems like there, we don't have enough beds and we don't have enough um, ACT teams and we don't have enough people answering if you call 911 or now 988. But um, the biggest place that I see now, and I've seen it from Jim's perspective, is when you're done with crisis, so you don't get back in the revolving door and you don't um, um, get into crisis again, when you're stable, can't we try harder to keep people stable? So one thing I, I'm, that NAMI Ramsey County is working on, and I'm now past president, so I'm cheering up this effort, is to get a clubhouse international in uh, Ramsey County. There are two in Hennepin County, the only two in our entire state. Even though they have these all over the world, we have been very slow to, um, to have them, but they're evidence-based, they're outcome-based, they work. And what they do most of anything is help people who want to work, which is most people, 80% of the people with schizophrenia want to work, help them get jobs. And they give job support, they help with training type jobs, and then they help people get jobs, they hang with them, it's over the top support. They do a lot of other things, but the employment, um, I see how it's working for Jim, he do, does so much better on the days he goes to work and has structure. So um, I think more people should have that opportunity. So Jim, you wanna close with your uh, top suggestions? Um, well, I, I think um, the National Institute of Mental Health, I think it was, did a study some years ago and they said that most important for people with schizophrenia or any serious mental illness um, to live a better life is employment, family support, and um, get, being on the least meds as possible. And my, my doctor now is definitely a, not a minimalist. So I'm, I'm not getting that right now. But um, the family has always been there, still is. The work has been spotty, but better than nothing. I had the, the opportunity to, and support to work throughout my 20s and 30s, as a lot of people with this went. Um, but yeah, that's that's really about it. I mean, so yeah, that, that's about it. Really. I mean, family and work and fun, <laughs> vacations, um, exercise, healthy diet, camping for me. And that's about it. And we are taking a vacation next month. We're going to the um, Rockies and staying in Estes Park. So we're all looking forward to that. So that concludes our presentation, and we would love to have questions from, from people that are here. And I know, or you could share things with us, because I know there's a lot of knowledgeable people on this at this meeting. If you're involved with NAMI, we all learn a lot. Well, I have a question. Hi, Jim. I'm Carolyn. I work at uh, one of the mental health centers in Grand Rapids. I work in the case management um, arms program. And I'm just wondering if you were offered case management and did you take it? Was it helpful? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I've had it. Uh, the very first time I got sick when I was 21, I was assigned a case manager and I was not really clear headed enough to understand exactly what it was, just the person I was talking to. and. Um, I, yeah, I, I've had a caseworker or, or the like other titles that are pretty much the same thing. So a person working with you, um, I've had that for most of my adult life. Um, I was at a program called Task Unlimited for 10 years or so, mm -hmm. um, supported living and employment services. And eventually I kind of outgrew that. Um, but I've had uh, 
caseworkers um, throughout that. And after that, yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of them actually um, kicked around from, you know, case manager to case manager. And now I have um, a woman from uh, People Incorporated, which is a company. I don't know how, if they're up there, but and she actually was or is a peer specialist as well as a regular uh, caseworker now. So yeah, she's really good. I think she's watching too. Yeah. <laughs> she's watching hi, Janet. Um, yeah. So yes, have lots. Yeah. And and Jim has always gotten his services from being in the hospital. It seems like that's the place where when you're in the hospital, you get connected with things that you couldn't get connected with as fast or as well otherwise. But you can just obviously call your county. Here in our area, you can go to the public library and get services, sign up for services with our county, which is a really good feature. And we've had um, some really wonderful case managers, and then we've had some that have such a high caseload and they're very busy that that um, it's harder to get a hold of them. But Jim is doing so well right now. Um, Janet doesn't have to do much with him other than support him, which she does really well. Um, Tara, I can see your hand up. Yeah. Hi, Mindy. Hi, how are you? <laughs> oh. I have a question more so I think for you, Mindy. Um, uh, recently, very recently for me, I found out that my brother has got this diagnosis of schizophrenia and um, depression and a whole bunch of other things. And it's um, to me, it's very hard because he has children quite a lot, okay? like five of them by multiple people. And a lot of his kids are still under the age. And he's at a point right now in his illness where he's not able to really be a parent. And, you know, he has been a parent to some of the older ones that are just now becoming adults. And they come to me for advice or, you know, wanting their dad. And I'm having a hard time with advice for them on how to deal with it. So I'm wondering if you have any advice for me on how to deal with this on a like uh, auntie level to younger children on why their dad really can't be a dad at the moment. You know, well, knowing you, I have a feeling you're instinctively saying the right things with them. But you know, there's it's very confusing. There, there is there are books. There's not a lot, but there are some books that um, that you could possibly Google. You know, books for teenagers. I just read one by a psychologist by the name of Michelle Sherman. So if you Googled that one, like on Amazon or something, Michelle Sherman and then teenage um, mental health, you probably come up with the name of it because I can't think of it right now, but it's written for teenagers. And these kids might be younger though, but that one I thought was really good for helping just to get some general ideas about how to talk about mental illnesses with with younger people. But I think the main thing is to assure them that it's not their fault. You know, often kids will think, well, did I do something? Or if their dad gets angry or isn't making sense, then they might think they did it, that it's their fault. And so I think that's really important and try to have them be sympathetic with him because he is sick. And then also the last, piece of advice I guess I would have would be to have um, an emergency plan. You know, if they felt like they weren't safe or he wasn't safe and they needed to get some help, what could they do? They could call you and what else could they do? And I think, you know, for a serious mental illness, especially if he isn't agreed to medication, which a lot of people don't at the beginning, then um, they need an emergency plan. So, 
Yeah. Once you can call me anytime to, to offline from here. Once upon a time, NAMI Minnesota had a uh, program called Kid Shops, I believe that was to help just children uh, of people with a mental illness better understand that, but I don't think they have it anymore. So I don't know, that might be a thought down the road to see if they can resurrect that. Right. Yeah, I think so too. Because like, yeah, kids really, really need some help. And I mentioned our granddaughter earlier that she's trying to help her friends, um, but she's having limited success. And they didn't, she's in Washington, I could, but they don't even have health class, you know, there in order to learn about mental illnesses or depression or anything. So I think there's a lot of lack of information. Uh, Lynn. Hi, good morning. I'm Lynn Cochran. I am on our local NAMI board and I'm also a member of our mental health crisis response team. We've had a lot of focus over the past few years about psychiatric health care directives. And I'm wondering yours and Jim's perspective on that. And if there is one, if that's been helpful for you as you're trying to access services and um, be able to follow through on what you really want when you're not in a good space to be able to say it in the emergency room or even when you get to the hospital. Thoughts on that? So you were cutting out a little bit. So I could you just say that one more time because I didn't quite catch every word. Sorry. Dang it. Sorry. Um, I'm wondering your perspectives on psychiatric health care directives. And if you have one, if it's been helpful. Oh, got it. Okay. Um, so Jim has one. And we think it is. Um, so for instance, I think I wrote, I wrote, I know I wrote about this in the book. Um, there have been times where he's had one and they don't use it. If you're not doing your best thinking. So we, I worked with um, Regents Hospital here in Ramsey County to make sure that if someone has a healthcare directive, it's on the front page of their electronic medical records so it doesn't get lost. So if your county isn't, or your hospital isn't using it and you have one, you could ask them for that. That was an easy ask. I um, met with a bunch of people and I, it's a whole chapter in my book and that they, they were happy to do that. They just hadn't thought of it. So that part of it is useful, uh, but the part that isn't useful in our experience with healthcare directives is they only kick in if the person isn't uh, deemed to be competent. So um, when you first get to, when, they, when your family member first gets to the emergency room, that's the time when the healthcare directive should be most strongly in play. And um, often, you know, when at that point, some families, we're very guilty of this too. We're just so relieved that he's getting help. And so we, we're tired and we need to regroup. And so we haven't gone right down immediately, but yet so then you miss your chance when you can really talk freely to everybody because they have a, that's when the healthcare directive kicks in. But once a person is doing better, then, um, then it's a more limited value. They have to still sign a medical release and everything. But having a plan and knowing what Jim wants is, you know, gives us a lot of comfort as we make decisions. You want to add anything? No, not really. Um, I don't know if it's ever, ever been used. Um, yeah. There's been times when it was probably a good idea to have one when I'm totally, totally out there. Um, so yeah, I guess, I mean, um, yeah, it could be, it can be a good thing. There was there one time, because we do have them, Jim has brought one up long ago and when he was probably in his second or third year of, of, of having, been in the mental health system. And so we always keep copies, we've updated it. Um, we tried to get guardianship for Jim a few years ago when he was really doing poorly and we were not able to get it 
because the, it took months and months to wind its way through the process. And by then he was doing better. So it, we couldn't get it. But if we'd been able to get to court right away, we, we would have gotten it. People were people incorporated and the hospital were recommending that we, that we take that measure. Um, but then we couldn't get it. But when our consolation prize then was to get a legal advanced directive and power of attorney, but again, they kick in when Jim is deemed not competent to stand, to stand or not to stand trial, but um, to make his own decisions in the hospital. So we see them as helpful, but of limited value at times. But certainly better, anything is better than nothing, is my thought about the mental health system. Any other questions? Have, and Lynn, have you had good experiences with them or or not <clears throat> similar to what you described it's a good tool to have it's helpful for the family and the individual but often isn't being looked at in the emergency situation where you really need it right yep that's one thing we find you know talking to people is that that a lot of people have the same experiences. And and I just want to say that I'm sorry for being so scatterbrained. I'm in opportune time to have a panic attack, which um, leaves me pretty much dysfunctional. <laughs> I always say if I took an IQ test when I was having one of these, it would be low. So I'm sorry. I think oh, you're doing man, I think you're doing awesome, Jim. Uh, um, right. can I ask you a quick question, Jim? Um, yeah. it's Sarah. Uh and I was just wondering, I um uh, I took the NAMI family to family. I think class it is to learn about you know, all the different mental illnesses and I deal with lots in my family, various ones. And uh -huh. I wanted to know, I found out a little bit because like I say, my brother got newly diagnosed with um, your mental illness. And I was wondering, I was told by doctors and other people in the field that um, my brother hears voices and that they will never really go away, but some of the medications will like lower the voices a little, but they said really the best thing is to distract him. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you find distraction helps you and maybe some of your like things that you do to distract, to make it a little easier for you? Um, yeah, I, I learned over the, over the years um, that playing on my phone helps. <laughs> like if I ha when I'm having a panic attack, I, I look, I, I think about things to look up on my phone. And I have no idea why, but for some reason, it seems like playing on my phone helps, which is kind of distraction. And also um, conversation seems to help too. In, in talking about anything at all, it just helps uh, help. So yeah, that's another form of distraction, I guess. So, so yeah, I think so. Lots of times Jim and I will talk if he's having breakthrough psychosis, then um, he said that helps him. So then we have a conversation or something like that. Um, one thing for your brother, you know, people don't let you use clozapine unless you fail first on two other antipsychotics. So if he has experience with two antipsychotics and he's still having a lot of symptoms, then um, he could ask for clozapine, which is, you know, does the best job of tamping down voices and hallucinations, but it also um, heals the brain, which the other ones don't do. They just mask the symptoms, um, but clozapine actually gradually over time and for forever can 
make your brain get better. And so that's, I think, the most hopeful drug. It's an old one that came out in the 1980s and the pharmaceuticals don't promote it because it's cheap and they make more money on the other drugs. Yeah, right now I'm having a hard time getting him to be med compliant and uh, not becoming a hermit sitting in his apartment doing absolutely nothing because he understands people look at him, you know, in a negative light. And then at times he's combating these voices and he'll like burst out with cuss words or, you know, something like that. And, you know, he gets humiliated. And so his, his answer is to lock himself in his own house by himself with no one. And I'm like, that can't be good, you know, but I can only that try my can't best. Be good. That's why, um, that's why I made my cause, as you know, right now, the Clubhouse International in Ramsey County. Is, which county is your brother in? He, right now, he's still in St. Paul in Ramsey County. I am hoping, you know, we just literally moved here last week. I'm hoping um, the end of this year, beginning of next year, maybe I can help him transition up here. So, Because the only family he has outside of his kids is me. And mm -hmm. the statistics from what I'm understanding with this illness is not very good. And it's probably even worse when you have no one. So I'm going to try to get him to do that. And I'm hoping he will. But right now, he just needs to feel safe. And that safe is an apartment he has where kind of like you were talking about Jim's situation, no services or you know, anything like that. And I tried my best to get him case management when I was down there before we moved. But I mean, his, unlike your son, my brother, ain't, he has a paranoia of electronics, people thinking that, uh, you know, he's being watched. And so the phone thing don't work, you know, so that's the one thing I think your son has up on my brother, I think, you know, and um, half the time, the only way to get in touch with him is to actually go there and bang on his door because he doesn't like answering the phone because he feels they're tapped and, you know, all this other oh, stuff. No. So yeah, it's very hard. Well, but I'm hoping everything in the uh, next six months to a year if we can survive that long, get them up here by me so at least I can be a support and get and be the best advocate for him I can be, you know. Well, family is, as Jim knows and says, is very hugely important. People who have family advocates always do better. It's just, a, it's a research-based fact. It's an evidence-based involvement, which is why I get so frustrated if the mental health system, you know, doesn't let families be involved or has roadblocks for that, because it really, really, really helps. And if there was a clubhouse, maybe your brother would eventually feel safe there because yes. people, <laughs> like him. Um, but he's clearly, you know, if he's cussing and because of his voices, which Jim has certainly done too, then um, he needs more help and more medication. He does, and that's another thing where I can't wait till we go back to the Capitol because he has tried to go to uh, the hospital and admit himself thinking that he needs help because, you know, he wants to do things with the family, but I'm telling him with all of our different diagnoses, I need you to be somewhat lucid. So you got to, you know, get yourself on something that helps at least a little more than what not. And so he did try and I guess he got real upset and mad because the hospitals wouldn't take him, I guess, cause uh, you know, like you said, understaffed and not enough beds and he just wasn't being that much of a danger to himself. And I'm like, 
what does he have to do? Actually, actively try to commit suicide or homicide? I mean, I don't want any of those. Not homicide, not suicide or anything, but it seems like in St. Paul right now, that's where you got to be at to get help. And it's like, no, that's, I can't wait till legislation come again. You know, I'm gonna be front and center because this is ridiculous. Yeah, you, know? you are. You put your finger on so many problems. And you know, I mentioned that when I worked on the civil commitment statute, we took out the word imminent and for 72 hour holds. But for um, for many of the different types of providers with the holds or the hospitals, they still have that word imminent in there. So um, that's why the hospitals reject people because some, many of them still want the person to be imminently dangerous to themselves or others, which means like right now. And so if they're even rational enough to take themselves there, then they're not gonna be admitted, you know, nine times out of 10 or more. So it's a, it, yeah, the system is, needs a lot of work. Mindy, um, Itasca area has a program called Keesler Wellness Center. And I don't know that they're specifically certified as um, a um, clubhouse international, but they have a lot of support services and pretty low threat approach to um, new um, people who are kind of new to dealing with their mental illness, Carolyn or Amanda or someone else that I see whose names are familiar, could you say a few words about how, um, how you see Keesler Wellness Center offering support? Sure, Marion, definitely low key. Like I think, you know, you walk in the door and someone is there to help you figure out whatever you're needing. Um, connecting to employment or PSS or ARMS. It's a beautiful building. If anybody's in the area wants to take a tour, they'd be happy to show it to you. So is that a mental health center, one of the uh, Rule 29s or? Um, no, but the Kiesler, it's the clubhouse. Kiesler Wellness Center is a clubhouse. So maybe they just haven't gone through the accreditation process because if they call themselves a clubhouse and they work on employment because you know a lot of the the drop-in type centers aren't out based they haven't gone through, through the accreditation or they don't work as much on employment but the one you're talking about sounds like a clubhouse so maybe they yes. just haven't uh, gotten it yep. and maybe I can say last Saturday the place they're talking you know I'm in recovery as well and uh, last Saturday, I went there for my first um, AA meeting, and I did get to check that place out, and it's awesome for, like, a clubhouse. And, yeah, I got pamphlets from them, and, you know, uh, some of the people was telling me to come back and check it out. They got pool tables there. They got a nice little kitchen area. I mean... I didn't even get to see everything else they offered, but I mean, I, their brochure says they do employment, arms, lots of different types of support groups, ranging from almost every topic I think I can think of. And it's like, wow, it is. So maybe I can talk to someone and see about their accreditation and check that out for NAMI part, you know, as well. Yeah, excellent. So you were at the same place Carolyn was talking about? Yeah, she, she, she uh, said that right. It's a nice place, at least from my experience so far, you know. Great. And I was on it, Carolyn. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, and I'm Becca. I'm a nurse care coordinator at Grand Rapids and at Grand Itasca. And um, I can say I've been to Kiesler Wellness Center now in their nice new building. Um, they you know, there was a smaller clubhouse before, but I've been there for different programs on mental health and um, uh, discussions of services, support services in the community that they put on. And they've got everything from pottery classes to woodworking shop to, um, you know, just a whole host of different support groups, barbecues, gardening group. Um, uh, it's, it's 
Narcotics Anonymous, uh, cooking classes, whatever, they, they have a whole range of things that um, go on there. And sometimes pay, um, different um, people that I've worked with might be dropped off by their, um, like the behavioral health home, their BHH workers might make sure that they get over there to get out of the house and, and socialize some. And I, I just feel like that's, that's a truly great asset to our community. Um, no doubt about that. And they've also helped to ad just advance, you know, the way people think about mental health in the community, along with NAMI and, you know, all the, the good things we've got going on. Well, excellent, excellent, excellent. Thanks, Becca. Um, I, when you said earlier, um, Mindy, that um, beds are still not available. Um, you're right. And, and that really does seem like it goes hand in glove with the whole uh, criminalization of mental illness. So um, there was just this past weekend, an example of a, a family um, with a young man who um, had a, a, a sort of a psychotic break and um, he was taken to the hospital by law enforcement. Um, unfortunately, the mental health crisis team was not called in and they tried to find a bed for him and could not in a, in a psychiatric facility. So the officer ended up um, taking him to the jail and you know, using something like disorderly conduct as the basis for that. Um, he is now out of jail and um, in a more appropriate facility. And by Wednesday, tomorrow, will actually be in, a, in a, an adult mental health um, crisis facility. But it shocked me a little that uh, in our community with all of the resources we have, we have a, a strong mental health crisis team and they work uh, closely with emergency departments. Um, they work closely with law enforcement. Um, still, somehow we managed to, that managed to slip through um, the system. And, and the end result was of course, an appearance in, in jail and probably an appearance before a judge in order to be, uh, to get out of jail, to be adjudicated, right. to be arraigned. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's really not an experience that um, is a part of the healing process from my perspective. Um, there are times when, yes, you know, legal consequences are needed, but that's, you know, during a psychotic incident is not when that's appropriate. So, um, yeah, the, the, you know, if what we can do to increase beds, what we can do to, you know, continue bringing home the message that alternative services are available, it's, it's, uh, it's critical, it's still happening. Yeah, there's plenty, plenty of uh, people in prison that did something that was, they didn't even know was, was wrong. Um, right. Considered bad for, you know, for most people, but like I was, when I was in Montana, I broke a window in my neighbor's apartment and went inside and lied on the couch all night hallucinating. So in, in, in reality, it was totally innocent. I thought I was supposed to do it as you know, responding to command. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So that was the, the first time he, that he ended up in jail. So then we had to I had to go out to Montana, get an attorney, which everyone couldn't afford, and they didn't have public defenders in Montana. So he was the only one in the whole place that had an, uh, an attorney promising not to let him come back. So I'm sure they were glad to get rid of him and one less person with mental illness in Montana. But why couldn't he have gone to the hospital instead is what we thought. And so there have to be more beds. And then there also have to be more ways to keep people out of the hospital. You know, for a while, NAMI Minnesota was kind of tepid, I think, on there being more beds because they wanted to focus on the ways to prevent people from having to go 
to the emergency room in the first place. And I'm sympathetic with that. But on the other hand, if you are in crisis, because there isn't a, a, um, a robust enough mental health system to keep you healthy and you need a bed, then you need a bed and instead of having to go to jail or wait in the hallway as some hospitals do. So we just need all the parts of the mental health system to make it work. But the fallback, as Jim said, is prison and jail. And the people in prison and jail, a lot of people like to say they're the same people that used to be in the state hospitals. And I used to say that too. It's the same number of people that are in the prison and jails that used to be in the state hospitals. But actually then I read um, Elisa Roth's book called Insane Consequences. I don't know how many of you have read that. She's an NPR reporter who covers, covers mental health issues with her beat along with other things. And she made the point that the peop, that they're not the same people because people like my grandmother were um, you know, elderly or middle-aged to older women and white and the average person in jail and prison who has a mental illness is young and a person of color and male. So they're kind of the opposite ends of the spectrum. So it's not, um, it's not the same population, but we sure have a lot of people in, in prisons and jails. And, and the people with schizophrenia are probably even more apt to be in jail just because they are doing often lower level crimes unless they're the very few that get involved in shootings and things. And speaking of, um, you mentioned this last incident, I don't know how many of you read about the young man who was 20 who was shooting in his apartment and, and there was the controversy of the fact that he was shot. And my question for all of that, I don't have answers for all of what went on, but my question was, what kind of mental health care was he getting, or if any, before it came to that? I wondered, had his parents tried and were told he wasn't sick enough yet? Had he gone to the doctor and was told he couldn't be admitted to the hospital or, you know, or hadn't they tried anything because they just didn't know about the mental health system or didn't trust? Mm -hmm. That was my question about that incident. Because I would hate to be blamed, you know, after I tried really hard to get help for Jim when he wasn't doing well. And then we still couldn't get any help. And then he did something. And then we became in the news, which I always worried about. Um, so I always feel sympathy for families, especially if they tried to get help and couldn't, and then something happens. But even if they didn't try because they didn't know what to do, I still feel sympathy for them too. Yeah, I, I completely agree that we, um, and I see um, uh, Rebecca was mentioning too that she's agreeing. I, I, we, can't, we can't just work on one little sliver of the system and think that's going to solve all the issues. We really have to work on the entire system in order to make it effective. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Mindy, yeah. Jim? Great group, great questions. <laughs> Good, good discussion there. Jim, I have a question for you about um, socialization, um, you know, uh, doing things with other people. Do you, do you feel like that's difficult to make connections with? Uh uh, and at times it's been difficult. <laughs> uh, I, I've, my whole life, wherever I go, I seem to end up with like two or three good friends. And right now here in Minnesota, I have, I say, five or six um, good friends that I see, see regularly, some more than others. Um, but yeah, definitely, I mean, of course, that uh, socialization is, um, is really important. Um, not like family, except different, and kind of like a social worker, but more real. they are not been paid to be your friend. So yeah, absolutely, friends, friends are really important. And yeah, uh, in the past, I have had trouble with socialization. Someone talks about someone sitting in their apartment all the time. When I was out west, I would 
pretty much just sitting in my apartment the whole time. And I had no one at all. So then it was bad. Uh, and then after, um, after I got sick and, and recovered, then I, I made, I had four friends. So yeah, it is hard sometimes. The older you get, the harder it is. And all of Jim's friends now pretty much have mental illnesses. So he had, he changed all his friends because the others, you know, got married and had careers and did this and did that. And so that period where he didn't have friends was really hard and it was hard on us to see as well. But um, he, and, and when he mentioned he was alone in his apartment, I actually heard from one of his friends there that they would go over to his apartment and try to help him. And all he did was cry and they just didn't know what to do. You know, that's why I think young people need help. And I think there's more available now than ever before, but there could be more, but his, so he, you know, the friends he had just fell away due to not knowing what to do and, and their lives moving on. But it seems like everywhere Jim goes, he usually ends up with one friend like out and keeps in touch with somebody and he has um, one good friend still from Pass Unlimited that he was where he was for 10 years, a really nice young man that was just over here a couple days ago. And then they go to coffee shops or come, come to our house and talk or go to Jim's apartment. You at Daniel, you know, his friend, he goes, they go a couple times a month. They go actually go to a bar and um have a beer or two and talk. And so different friends do different things. But I think Jim is really lucky compared to most people that I talk with. Um, I I'm on, do a podcast with two other mothers um, that wrote books about their son's schizophrenia. And both of their sons don't have, have friends. And that's such a heartache for them and for their families. And as Jim said, it helps him with his psychosis if he's having any to talk. And if you're all by yourself and you're not talking with anyone, then um, then you just get worse and worse. So, so what's one of the best things that providers, mental health providers can do to um, engage families and, and reach out to families when they're working with someone with mental illness? Um, I just think to communicate is like key. I don't know that families even have to do anything or the providers have to do anything, but just to reach out and communicate is doesn't always happen, but I think it's the most important thing of all because families left in the dark um, often aren't as apt to be involved. If their family member is pushing them away because they're not getting good mental health care and they're feeling paranoid about their families. So there was a, in Jim's early days, he thought I was the devil and other times he thought he was the devil, but either way um, it didn't facilitate good communication because he was delusional. He wasn't getting good mental health care. And so those are times that are very distressful for families and someone needs to reach out and communicate and help educate and of course, we took the family to family, you know, with NAMI and got educated that way. But but you have a real need, I think, as a family member to, to communicate with the providers. And so if they the person hasn't signed a release, then um, I think they should do everything possible to encourage the person to and then, then um, communicate as needed. I'm very low key, um, you know, Janet, who's on the call, who's working with Jim right now with People Incorporated, um, could tell you that I just met her today over the phone when she was asking for help after talking with Jim on how to log on here, because uh, I don't need to communicate with her because Jim is doing well. Um, but when he's not doing well is when providers are most apt to not be communicating somehow. And, um, and then 
families can get very out of sorts and get obnoxious, maybe from the provider's point of view. You know, I just met with a mother yesterday whose son actually died last month and he was 21. And she talked about shrieking. I think shrieking was her word when she was talking to providers because she was so desperate, you know, trying to get help for her son. So then I think providers maybe are leery of parents, you know, if they're shrieking at them, but why are we shrieking when we're shrieking? It's because we're desperate, you know, for some help for, for our children and people, families aren't always at their best when they're advocating, you know, you can be shrieking and or mad or, you know, perceived as very uncooperative to the provider. So when I was a teacher, I like to compare it to that. Um, I always made a special effort to contact all the families the first week of school, just so I could, for everybody, have my first encounter be a positive one. And um, some kids, I made sure I called their families first because I could see maybe I was gonna have to make another call at some point soon that wouldn't be positive. Um, but I just think, but all families were so appreciative of that initial just, hello, I'm Mrs. Greiling and I've got your so-and-so in my fourth grade class and blah, blah, blah. And um, just to know they could contact me if they needed or something was going on at home that I should know. And then hardly anybody ever does, but they just feel comforted um, when they can. But I think the um, person-centered care that's in vogue right now, it's very important to have people be able to make their decisions, people like Jim. But I think sometimes um, that has been interpreted as families have no say. And Jim and I actually both meet with his current psychiatrist. We meet together on a Zoom just like this. Jim does most of the talking, but the psychiatrist wants to know, not just from Jim, but also from a family member, how he's doing. In he says he's doing terrible. He's having all these breakthrough psychosis. And I can say, well, but compared to, you know, it's hardly anything. And if you only talk to Jim, he would, the doctor might think he's doing terrible or something. It just helps with the picture of any illness. And I think we don't have to make mental illnesses so strange that it pushes families away. I know families that have nothing anymore to do with their family member who has schizophrenia because they've been so pushed away by the system. And that's not the result I don't think anybody wants. Absolutely. Families, families have to remember that um, even if there's not a release signed by you know, the person with the mental illness, the family can always provide input to the medical team, to the psychiatrist in writing, you know, whatever, phone call. Um, so that that's very possible to do. Exactly, and the providers need to know they can do that, you know, and not say, I can't talk to you, I can't accept, you know, they do have to stand and listen to you if, you know, your family member is in the hospital, even though they can't talk to you, they, they still have to somehow provide a way for you to give input and they should actually want it. And they can talk back in generalities. They can say, I can't discuss your specific son's case, but generally speaking, people who have schizophrenia who are doing this or that, this is you know, what we do, what we recommend, or what, this is the outcome, or their families, the ones I can communicate with, um, you know, generally it works if they do this. You know, there's workarounds if you really think family is important. There's a rare family maybe that's counterproductive, but an abusive family or something, but all families get treated as if they might be abusive or causing the illness at times. And then when you're already under stress, that just brings you down really low. Mindy, could you tell us more on how to access your podcast that you referenced? Yes, I'm delighted do so. So if you just Google um, schizophrenia, let's see, uh, yeah, schizophrenia colon, three moms in the trenches, and the three is a numeral three. So schizophrenia colon, three moms in the trenches. And we've been doing it for um, about a year and a half. And 
when I first, when my book first came out, one of them contacted me and invited me to be on this program. And one of the mothers is a radio program, a radio announcer and host programs and things. She does ad hoc things for NPR actually. So she's really good, Randy Kay. And she, um, she does, she's written a book called Ben Behind His Voices. She, that came out like over 10 years ago. And she recently wrote another book, kind of a self-help. And then the, so she's in Connecticut and the other mother is Mimi Feldman from the state of Washington. And her son, uh, both, all of our sons have schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. So it's a, we, we have different topics each time. Sometimes we just talk amongst ourselves, but mostly we have guests. Well, the person who will be on tomorrow night, actually, will be talking about um, SSI, it's an attorney who will talk about SSI and SSDI, which is, you know, sometimes a bit different in different states. So we have to take that into consideration because our listeners are national. Um, but this attorney will talk about, um, you know, how can you get on, get signed up and how can you get it and do you need an attorney? And we ask for the listeners for um, our regular viewers, and we have like 40,000 now, um, mm -hmm. questions that they might have ahead of time. So we, I think we're going to have to do more than one program because we have so many questions that, um, that I don't think we can cover them all. We usually try to make the programs 45 minutes, and occasionally they get to be an hour or more. But um, listeners like, like to listen more like 45 minutes and not an hour or more. So we strive for that, um, but we've had topics like um, um, how to um, how to access the mental health system, or you know, all the things we're talking about today. We've talked about. We had Pete Early was on last week, who wrote the book Crazy, and he was kind of on to represent um, the father's point of view because mostly women are the ones who do the lion's share of work in the families who are dealing with serious mental illness, but in his family, it's him. So, so we had him on, um, we've had on um, Javier Amador who wrote the book, I am not sick, I don't need help. And all of the podcasts are, you know, archived on our webpage. So you could go back and listen to any of them. So it, it I'm, I'm a technological fool to some degree. Uh -huh. um, is there a way, um, and, and Jim can probably answer this, but is there a way for us to link your podcast or, or put your podcast link on our webpage so that people could, who are looking at our webpage could automatically log into? Yes, yeah, you could definitely do that. Just- I don't know, I don't know how to do it. Oh, so. how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't have to know how because yeah, no. I'll find somebody. <laughs> yeah, I'm a webmaster of some sort. Yeah, but okay. you can, can do it. Thank you, Jim. But you but can't. That would be it. great because a lot of. Um, be okay with that. Yes, absolutely. The more people, as long as we're doing it, we might as well help more people. We get referred, you know, NAMIs and psychiatrists and psychologists even are referring people you know, to our podcast, because everyone who's especially those starting out have so many questions, and this way they can just scroll down to the topic and get some help. But mostly, I think we provide support. You know, we're just moms who are giving our opinions and talking about the wars we've been through, and all of us are, all three of us are, have been dealing with this, you know, for 20 years or more. So we're we're veterans of this journey. It, it is absolutely critical in reducing stigma that families who experience mental illness can talk about it. And I'm just so impressed with your family to do this. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, like I said, I was lucky to be to be a legislator when I when Jim got sick. And I still now I contact my legislators. So yeah. they are very helpful as well. Good. Any other final questions? Roger, was there anything you wanted to add to, to wrap things up? 
No, for better or worse, I'm the silent uh, partner here, I guess. Uh, I, you know, appreciate everything Mindy's done. I way more than I would have ever been capable of for not only Jim, but for many others, obviously, as well. So, and and uh, yeah, we're obviously glad he's doing well to state the most obvious thing of all. So. Great. Do, do people comment to you sometimes about the book? Um, not really as much because I, I mean, nowadays I'm not working anymore and I, you know, I don't see a lot of new people, quote unquote, you know, so mm -hmm. people that I see have, you know, have read it. So um, yeah. although this uh, visitation we went to this morning, uh, mm -hmm. Mindy referenced, there was, you know, a couple people there commented on it to her. So yeah. I, get, I get lots of comments, but maybe Roger not so much. But remember, we just went out with two people Saturday night that were talking about it. They had just read it. Rogers, he's not as uh, apt to be bringing it up or, you know, everywhere I go, probably a lot of us on this call, people talk about mental illness a lot, but, but I think men are slower to do that, which is why we talked about that phenomena with Pete early at our last podcast. Great. When you did the radio interview uh, with KAXC, um, they're really an, an incredible community partner to us and they will you know, present information on all kinds of topics related to mental health needs. Um, I mentioned that I was in the, in the car on a um, driving during that interview and um, the, the conversation in the vehicle after the interview ran about 15 or 20 minutes. And so it reminded me just how important those things are, you know, when you, when you work at that or a NAMI member, you know, just kind of comes like, well, okay, we got to do this. We got to do that. We got to get the word out here. We got to, you know, show uh, awareness there. And, and you don't always, and hardly ever, I should say, get the actual feedback on the impact that that has had. So when we decide to help the Lions Club at a local festival, uh, dish up burgers, and we've got our NAMI stuff out, we may not hear much feedback at the burger stand, but you have no idea how many people walk by and go, hey, there's that NAMI group. I wonder if so-and-so would be able to use that info. You know, I mean, we just, we have no way of knowing that. And, and so building public awareness, you just can't do enough of it. And it's so important when individual families can talk about it because it makes it so much easier for others. And by the way, a NAMI Grand Rapids area is a phenomenal NAMI. Um, we, NAMI Ramsey County, we were second in raising money for NAMI walks last year, and we noticed you were first. So <laughs> you're deaf. And you have uh, the, the media market is really huge. You know, to have a TV station and a radio station where you can amplify the NAMI voice, you know, is so wonderful and so important. And yes, that radio, those radio announcers were so, so supportive and knowledgeable. Yeah, supportive, knowledgeable, and very sensitive. Um, uh, yeah, and, and John, um, was, is also experienced. You know, his family has experienced mental illness issues. And so you know, he comes from that very honestly, very genuinely. Yeah, that makes perfect sense based on how he was. Any other questions for Mindy and Jim? Thank you all so much for hanging in there. I know we've uh, we've only lost about uh, five participants. We had a total of about 25. So um, we're very pleased that you could come and join us today. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule. You've got a lot going on. Really appreciate that. And, and um, thank you all for participating. Yes. Okay. Thanks for having us. Have a good day. Enjoy the summer. All right. Thank you. Too. Bye.